All right, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, and let's go ahead and just dive right in. So today we're talking about using a Redbird to maintain proficiency at home. Um, first off, my name is Josh Harnigal. I'm the VP of Marketing for Redbird. I'm also a CFI, WI, and MEI. And um, well, I struggle with proficiency. Uh, I don't fly as much as I should. You know, I have a job and a kid, a wife, and um, just like probably a lot of y'all, it's a it is can be a struggle to feel like I'm keeping up with my aviation proficiency. So this is um, this presentation is going to be hopefully useful to you, but um, I have to warn you, I may get on a soapbox or two a little bit about this because it's it's kind of personal because I struggle with it as well. So uh, let's dive right in. Um, using a Redbird for proficiency at home. Well, really, it's pretty easy. Um, step one, buy a Redbird. Step two, use it every week. All right, that's it. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we'll go ahead and call it here. Just let us know if you have any questions. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll really dive in a little bit more. Um, so when we're talking about how to use a, a tool like a Redbird simulator or really anything, um, any simulator for, for the most part, um, but you know, we're biased, um, there are a couple of steps that you have to do to um, to really make make it useful. But before we really get into that, um, this is that soapbox that I'm warning you about. I wanted to dissect a little bit about what I mean by proficiency and and why it's important. And um, I know you guys were probably signed up thinking you were going to get a webinar talking about products and how to use it and that kind of stuff. But actually, you've now signed up for a lecture from me on what it means to be a proficient pilot. But anyways, um, the the number one cause of accidents is, I think everyone probably knows this, no secret, it's pilots. Um, the number one way to prevent accidents is, again, probably no secret, be a proficient pilot. So the question is, why is this hard? And that's a real question, not just, not not rhetorically, but there's, there is a reason there, you know, this is a hard problem that a lot of people um, deal with. And proficiency is a goal uh, that we state. And that right there is the number, is the first problem when we talk about why is proficiency hard? Well, because pilots don't have a stated goal to maintain the proficiency. They don't know what proficiency means. Achieving a goal requires a plan. Oh, there's another problem. Most pilots don't have a defined proficiency plan. They can't tell you what they're going to be doing this week, next week, or six months from now to build on or maintain the proficiency that they've achieved. And again, this doesn't apply to anybody on this uh, webinar, I'm sure. All of you, I'm sure, have a defined goal, plan, well thought out, and, and really keep up with it. And this is more just for every, all those other pilots. Um, a proficiency plan requires practice, and practice can be very time-consuming and expensive. Problem number three, most pilots don't practice. So, in summary, most pilots don't have a, have a goal, have a plan, and they don't practice for proficiency. Therefore, pilots are the number one cause of accidents. This is kind of circular logic, but it gets around to what, what were really the meat and potatoes of what I mean when I say a proficient pilot. Um, what we'll cover today is how to make a, a, a goal, a plan, and how to practice, and obviously a hint in a Redbird. Um, so what's a proficiency goal? Let's start with proficiency. Proficiency, as defined by Webster, is a high degree of competence or skill, expertise. I really like adroitness. That's a wonderful world, word. I'd love to be called an adroit pilot. Um, professionalism is another synonym that stands out for me. But you'll notice nowhere in that definition does it say meets the FAA legal requirements to be current. Therefore, currency does not equal proficiency. Typically, if you're proficient, you're also current, but they're not one and the same. And I don't think that's groundbreaking. Most pilots know that. But um, it is an important distinction that we need to make. And you know, when I talk about creating a proficiency goal, um, you know. Those of you that have, well, probably everyone has experience with goals. And a goal with no plan is pointless. So instead of saying, this is how you set a goal and separating it from this is how you set a plan, um, I'm really gonna go talk through the plan and in that process, how you set a goal. So I've already deviated from my outline, but here we go. Um, what's a personal proficiency plan? Well, 
the FAA has some guidance, and it's actually pretty good. Um, in the in AC number 6198D, um, it's a re that's a really great document to read. It covers how to do IPCs and flight reviews, um, and it talks a lot about how to make proficiency plans. A lot of what I talk about comes from that um, document. In specific, though, um, 1.9.1 says specifically the, the FAA doesn't think that just because you're current, you are proficiency, uh, you are proficient. Um, so the FAA is on our side on this. We need to do more than the basic regulations require. The FAA also has some, uh, thinks it's important for you to set goals and plans. So we have a personal aeronautic, aeronautical goal worksheet that the, that the FAA has produced. It's interesting. Um, has some useful information. Personally, I don't really, it just doesn't fit my personality type to do these kind of worksheets, uh, but for some of you, it may be really useful. And so again, this is AC 61, um, what did I say, 6198D. Um, and in the appendix, that's where I got these from. Um, we also have a uh, practice, a thing to do in practice while you're, you're working on your proficiency plan. So the FAA recognizes this is a problem and pilots struggle with it and they give us some tools. I will say, I don't know that a lot of people actually follow through with these things. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question of the group. Um, and you can be honest, these are anonymous. Um, do you have a stated proficiency goal and plan? Go ahead and vote. And I'm gonna leave it up for just a few minutes just to let people vote on this so they can, so I can kind of get a sense. All right, so about half of you have voted and we got roughly 70% saying no, 30% saying yes. Okay, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed that 30% of you have that. Um, I don't, you guys are definitely in the, I would just anecdotally say it's more like 10% of pilots have something like that. So good job, we got a great, um, Great and active audience here. So I'll go ahead and close that. And now, so for me, I'm, a, you know, my day job is as the vice president of marketing. So I think in a lot of terms of a business and uh, a business plan. And so there's this, this kind of template of a business plan that I use uh, sometimes, and it breaks things down into mission, objective, policies, procedures, and budgets. And you work from the hierarchy, the highest goal set all the way down to the implementation details of how you're gonna actually achieve that mission. And I think the mission for this for this exercise, mission is a little bit, um, it's more, it's like a broad goal, I guess. Uh, it's not a full mission statement like you'd see at a corporate corporation. But I, I've done this, um, this part of the presentation before at the, uh, at the Pilot Proficiency Center at Oshkosh. And I think it's a useful, even if you don't follow this format or you prefer the FAA's format, I think it's useful to think about these things in some detail um, about how you're going to maintain, become and maintain a being a proficient pilot. So let's start, let's just go through this. Mission, uh, organization, it, dic it dictates the fundamental purpose of an organization. Um, so if I were to say an example for a, a pilot, I don't know that these are mine, maybe these are mine. Um, Master the art and science of aviation, that's pretty broad and lofty. That may not appeal to your, uh, your specific personality type, but um, maybe something like, I wanna feel confident in my ability to perform at my level of certification or higher. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot is that uh, like an instrument rated private pilot will feel very comfortable in VFR conditions, but basically never flies in instrument conditions. They have the privileges, but they, they don't exercise them. Um, and I think that that's a real miss. They, they, they have an opportunity to fly in really um, interesting conditions and push their envelope and become a better pilot no matter the conditions. Uh, and I think SIMS can be really helpful with that. So objectives, these are sort of short-term uh, goals, targets, specific uh, results that we're trying to achieve. So for in this example, we laid it out, I laid it out as 50 hours a year, flying twice a month, flying instrument procedures in a sim twice a month, in a Redbird, hopefully, and uh, two long cross countries every year under IFR, I should have said that. Um, 
so what about policies? Policies are what we, are the statements of understanding. They guide our decisions. These are personal minimums in a lot of case, but we can expand that idea of personal minimums out a little bit. So we have weather minimums. Um, and when I say stay out of the red, I mean convective activity. Um, and, but we can also expand it out to say, I want to fly with the CFI once a quarter. Even though I'm not required, the FAA has no requirement for that. I think that that's a useful thing. Um, and then this is my personal favorite because it drives um, a lot of use of the sim and it also makes you a much better instrument pilot when you're actually in the soup, is never shoot an instrument approach procedure in an airplane before you do it in a simulator. Just don't do it. So if you happen to be flying to an airport and it has five approaches, shoot all five of those approaches in the sim before you go. And you might want to shoot the three or four approaches at um, an alternate nearby as well. You've accomplished, a, you, you, you will not be walking in blind no matter what the weather, no matter what the notums say. You, you've now spent a bunch of time in a simulator, put yourself in a bunch of different situations that are potentially uncomfortable, something you're not used to, and you've accomplished a goal, a short-term goal. Um, procedures. So this is another, um, again, this is diving down into details. So I said I want to fly the sim every two weeks, let's say, or I want to fly with an instructor every quarter. What are the steps that need to happen to make those goals um, doable. In this case, I'm saying schedule flights three months in advance so I can, so that way I put a date on the calendar and something else doesn't come up because that date's booked. I, I can't, you know, we can't go camping that weekend uh, because I'm going flying or, or whatever. Um, fly this in every other Thursday, you know, pick a time, pick a day, put it on your calendar. This is what I'm going to do um, every day, every, you know, as a routine. And then uh, this is another real key one. And this, I, I do a presentation on um, best practices for training in a Redbird simulator that's for instructors primarily. And this is really key to that. And it's key to your personal flying as well is have a goal for every flight and log the outcome. So if your goal is I'm gonna fly um, steep turns and slow flights, I'm gonna practice steep turns and slow flights on this flight. And I wanna perform them within the private pilot ACS standards um, three times. So uh, I want to do steep turns until I get to private pilot ACS standards three times in a row or whatever. Go out and do that and then log it. Say you accomplish this goal or you still need to work on it. So that way you have a, a you have a record of what you're working on specifically towards your proficiency and you can see how you've progressed over time. And then um, this is a this is really for me, um, but I think it can be helpful for some people depending on how you learn. If you're in a specific aircraft type, or especially if you're going to a new aircraft, um, you have the the manufacturer's POH with the checklist in it. You may have a third party checklist, like you know a bunch of companies produce third party checklists. I find it to be useful. Um, I'll use the manufacturer's POH one time. And then I'll use the, a third party checklist another time. And then after I've got a five hours in that airplane, I will make my own personal checklist for that airplane. It's mostly a combination of the POH and the third party one, but I include some other stuff because maybe I, the, I have a, fl a specific flow I like to use or I fly with Ford flight and potentially this airplane has got um, a connection where I can connect my um, Ford flight to, to a scout or something like that, whatever the case may be, not just make a checklist for the whole thing, not just the specific functions of that airplane, but the whole process, you know, making sure you have a flashlight, all that kind of stuff. And even if um, you're, it's pretty redundant and you don't actually use it all that much, the process of making that checklist will force you to think through every step that you need to do in every phase of flight in that airplane. And it really will increase your systems knowledge, your preparation for flying. I think it's it can be, it's a good, you know, at home, away from the airport activity that can help you understand your flying a little bit better. And then the last one is budget. Um, I didn't include this because you know everyone's budget is different, but the before you call this proficiency plan done, you got to have the money to do it. We all know that aviation is expensive, um, but there are ways to do it at different price points, at different budgets. And so figure out how much you are willing to dedicate to flying in a given year or a given month and plan out how you are going to spend those dollars. Um, if you have a plan for those dollars when you go into it, 
it's going to make the act it's going to make it less painful to spend them because you already know that you're planning on spending them and it'll keep you in you know in a framework to work through and it keeps your your it can inform your goals and make sure they're they're realistic you know maybe you say i want to fly 300 hours a year but you don't own an airplane and it's rental um, and rent, renting is your only option, you might not have the budget to support that. So you might have to scale your goals to fit that need. Um, okay, so enough of my soapbox about being a provision pilot. I think it's probably time to start the meat of the webinar, right? The actual point that you guys signed up for when you went to our landing page. Uh, how do you use a Redbird to main, maintain proficiency at home? Um, but before I get go onto that side, I just wanna make sure there's no questions. Um, th that was, again, my soapbox. I appreciate you guys for um, putting up with me, but um, we're going to go in and we're going to talk a little bit more about the Redbird products specifically. Our, we'll go through our product line and some of the details on it, and then we'll talk about like tips and tricks and how to use it really to maintain your proficiency. So um, again, I think I appreciate your patience with that first part, but if there's any questions, go ahead and type them in the box and let me know, and we'll get to them. Um, okay, so let's talk about our line of simulators. We have a um, kind of a, a fairly wide breadth. If you start on the left, that's the Redbird TD. There's two versions of that. We'll get into it in a little bit. In the middle, we have the J and the J Velocity, two versions of that. We'll get into that one in a little bit. And in the right, you have the uh, Alloy Home Sim desktop controls. So from left to right, we go from most capable, technically FAA approved, to uh, less feature function um, and not approved. Um, we also go kind of, you know, they, they fit in different, obviously in, from most expensive on the left to least expensive on the right. Um, and they kind of fit different needs depending on what, what you want to accomplish and where, where you sit in, the, in, um, in your plan and, and what goals you want to um, go through. And Robert, yes, so we'll, we'll talk about um, the nav updates and to keep a Redbird current. We'll get into that when we get to the TD part. Um, all right, so we're going to start at the alloy control line. So if you um, just want to start out and build a simulator at home, um, we offer these alloy controls. These are USB devices that you plug into a PC or Mac computer that you uh, already own or buy specifically for this purpose. On that computer, you're going to need to load flight, load flight simulation software, potentially avionics software. We don't handle any of the computer part. All we make are the, the actual hardware controls. They are um, met, made out of metal. They use a lot of this, and they basically use all the same internal components as our large sims. Um, and it's um, they're very robust. They're a little big, which is the main complaint people have is that they take up a lot of space on the desk, but they are specifically made for um, general aviation aircraft. You'll notice that if you are in, involved in home flight simulation at all, you'll notice a lot of the hardware controls that are out there are designed for airline style flying or military jets and that kind of thing. And that's primarily because most of that market um, wants to fly airliners and military jets. They don't, they're not using um, home simulation for working on their flying in an airplane that matches what they could actually fly. So um, we designed ours for pilots. I mean, we're a company of pilots making products for pilots. Um, so that's where the, the, the alloy fits in. We have the yoke, a rudder, um, and then three different throttle quadrants, the single engine vernier, um, the twin engine boat style, and a, twin, a single engine boat style. All of them have um, gear levers and flap handles. Uh, the um, and the price points on these are I think around five to seven hundred dollars. The throttles are like five hundred and thirty dollars, five hundred and forty dollars. The rudder pedals are five hundred and fifty dollars. The yokes I think seven hundred dollars. Um, we just reintroduced or relaunched the a uh, new version of the YK1, and I want to point this out because sometimes uh, we haven't, you know, this is on me as the VP of marketing, but we haven't gotten uh, pictures updated on, on all the various places where there's pictures of it. But the new YK1 has um, um, buttons, settable buttons. So you, on the left-hand side, there's an autopilot disconnect, a push to talk, electric trim. And then on the right side, it's a five-position hat switch. So up, down, left, right. And um, 
and an enter button, I believe. Um, these can all be mapped to whatever function you want in your flight sim. If you're doing, if you're using the YK1, you're doing it at home on a PC and a simulation setup that you built yourself. And so we don't really, I think there is a default mapping if you plug it into prepared, but you're going to have to go into your controls and, and, and map it out um, how you actually want it. So stepping up from that, if you don't want to build your own home sim and you just want something that you can put on a desk, we have two versions of the Redbird J. So we'll start with the J itself. Um, the, the idea behind the J is that um, pilots or it, actually a lot of high schools and middle schools and museums um, want to have a flight simulator that's got physical controls um, that they can just sit on a desk um, with uh, and plug it in and it works. And there's not a bunch of configuration. You don't have to find a computer. You don't have to find a monitor. Um, and that's what the J is. So the J base price for the standard J is $2,500, $2,600. And then the um, J velocity, I think, is thirty-nine, about $4,000. The primary difference between the J and the J velocity is the velocity was built in um, response to a lot of demand from museums and high schools and middle schools for a product like this. And they have a different environment than one at home. And they have, you know, kids and the public coming in and grabbing controls and, and messing with it. So the, the velocity is built to be a much more robust product. It uses, um, it has a little bit better computing power and it uses better um, internal, like more robust internal hardware. Um, and that's part of the reason that there's a cost difference involved. So kind of depending on your use case, you might wanna um, get one or the other. The, the other thing is um, all, the, the, all of our desktops that I'm going to talk about are compatible with the RD1 rudder pedals. The J will use any USB rudder pedals, even our competitors. You plug it in, it'll work. Um, we recommend the RD1s. But if you're going to be using it for training, I think it's really important to have um, rudder pedals. It'll fly without it. It does a thing called auto rudder, where um, it basically keeps the airplane coordinated all the time. But if you're, like I said, if you're using it for um, for actual proficiency training, I think having rudders is a big is a big need. Um, the the J is not an FAA approved device, so it's it's just like a desktop computer home simulator. Can't log any time on it, but you can definitely use it for proficiency training. You can shoot those approaches. Um, I think it's a great um, a great way to shoot approaches. <clears throat> um, and because it's not, um, it, because it's not a um, FAA-approved device, we have a lot more flexibility um, with like aircraft models. So it comes preloaded with a with a bunch of aircraft on board, um, but you can also load any commercially available, publicly available um, aircraft model that works with. Lockheed Martin prepared 3D. So, and that that's the simulation engine we use on all of our products. Um, on any of the FAA approved devices, you can't load any other so any other airplane software because there is an FAA approval. And when you make modifications to it, that approval becomes invalidated. So, assuming you bought it because it's approved and that's an important thing to you, you don't want to add new simulation or new airplane models. So the J is great if you want to fly a Baron and a Learjet and a 172 um, and an extra, whatever. Um, it does have physical controls. They're they're very generic. So starting on the left, you have a mag mag and starter switch, and then you have the yoke. It's the same yoke that's the on the YK1 with the uh, autopilot disconnect, push to talk, electric trim, and five position hat switch. Um, and then you have a throttle and mixture boat style, and then you have a flaps handle um, on the, or it's really a flap switch, not a handle uh, on the far right side. Um, all right, so we got a couple questions. I'm gonna go through these real quick here. Robert, I'm still gonna get to your question about nav updates. Um, is there a travel container for the J Velocity unit? We go to several different schools, youth organizations for the STEM events. So we don't sell one. Um, I have had, we have made custom travel containers uh, for TDs and Js before for our marketing purposes, but we just um, contracted with a company that does that. They call them road cases. Um, if you want to 
do that. If you would like to go through that, um, it can be kind of expensive, but if, you, if you're doing a bunch of travel, it, it's definitely worth it. Um, we can provide all the dimensions that they're going to need for all the components um, to build a um, to build that to fit a J or if you have multiple J's. Um, and this goes for everybody. If you have questions that don't get answered, or if you if I tell you to, if there's more follow up, you can send an email to info at redbirdflight.com, and we can get back to you and get in touch. Um, so thank you, Edward. Um, so where do we get the approaches? to load in the desktop. Okay, so um, I believe this is talking, this was asked when I was talking, Harold asked this when I was talking about the J. Um, so the J has got, all of our SIMs come, and we'll talk about this with the nav data, all of our SIMs come with uh, the base nav data that was in um, the product when Lockheed Martin bought it from Microsoft. So this was based off of Microsoft ESP, which is based off of Microsoft X, my Flight Sim X. Um, so it, you know, it's there's a bunch of iterations of it. So the core nav data is based off of that, which is now very old. There are third-party nav update solutions uh, to bring it up to date. Um, for our certified devices, you have to use uh, one called um, Real Nav. For our Non-certified devices like the J, you can use RealNav. It's and actually it's a little bit it's it's cheaper than the cost for the certified device. It's a personal license. I think it's 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Um, and you honestly you could probably use other nav data sources if you can find them. Like uh, I think Navigraph uh, makes some as well. But um, on the TD, when we get to that slide, you have to use RealNav, and it's actually a professional license um, that you have to get to make it work with the TD. So it actually, now I hope hopefully that was the question. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit more. If you want to load an approach, if you're if that's what you're talking about, physically, like actually loading an approach um, uh, on the uh, J, the depending on the avionics that you have on, you can have um, you know a G1000, you can have the Garmin 43530. Um, I think there may be some other GPS setups. So it's you have to you use the, a mouse and you push the you know, click the buttons in the virtual cockpit like you see there where it shows a virtual cockpit. You click the buttons like you would um, be doing in in the airplane. Obviously, that's not a great solution, but at this price point, that's what um, that's where you're you're getting. And it's not an FAA approved device. Um, so the other thing I'd recommend with the J that a lot of people like is a um, <clears throat> Is instead of a mouse that moves around and has a pointer, it's one of those mount the, the kind of mice that um, it's got a trackball with a thumb that you move with your thumb, um, and then ideally there's some that have a trackball with a little ring on the outside that rotates, and that can be really nice because then you can just use your thumb to move the cursor over the, the instrument in question and rotate the ring to turn a knob. Um, so that can be a really helpful thing. There are Ways you can also bring up the panel so it fills up the whole screen. Um, and there, on our support website, there are there are documentation about bringing up the different um, uh, the different waypoint or the different screens, the different views with um, the keyboard. And then you can have, and it's a little easier to to get in and actually move the um, cursor or, or move the um, avionics correctly. Um, okay, so I think that's on the, the J. So uh, let's move on to the TD2. Okay, there were the TD. So the Redbird TD comes in, again, two varieties, a Redbird TD and a Redbird TD2. So primary difference is um, the TD is set up to be a fixed gear, uh, standard, um, basically a 172, 172-ish airplane. It's got a throttle and a mixture knob. But that's it. Uh, the TD2 has the ability to be retractable gear. It has a throttle, prop, and mixture knob. When you start a flight, you can um, you can start a flight with any. You can it can be high performance, complex, or retract, or any variety of that um, if you want. And um, so, if you're flying like a 182 Bonanza. 206, something like that, uh, the TD2 is, is a better fit for that specific market. 
Now, uh, a question we get all the time is, does it have a twin engine throttle version? Can you simulate different airplanes? Um, so the answer is no, uh, not right now, but it's definitely on our roadmap for the TD is to build it so that we can do other things. Um, the, it also, the TD has two approved avionics conversion. And this is when I say TD, from this point on, I'm talking TD and TD2. It has two approved avionics configurations. You can have um, an analog gauge, analog instrument panel, like you see on the screen with a Garmin 530 emulator, or you can have a glass panel Garmin G1000 emulator. Um, they're not, other than that, those are the set avionics. Again, this is, and that, since it, because of the FAA approval, we're very limited in what we can get, how much flexibility a single unit can have. I will say, again, the TD is, um, there are plans to have, add more avionics configurations as as needed or, or as requested, I guess. Um, and so the TD, like, keep mentioning is approved as a basic aviation training device. And I'm gonna get into some details for that um, on the next slide, but just as an overview, what we have, you have actual buttons and knobs on that overlay panel. So if you wanted to go up and change your heading uh, on the gauge, you'd reach up and twist the knob to turn it and that will change it on the digital display. So the gauges are displayed digitally, but there's actually a knob in front of it in, embedded in a piece of glass that um, or a piece of acrylic that has a little potentiometer sensor in it that you can turn to um, adjust the whatever it is. Same for the GPS, the autopilot, whatever. Uh, it also has a set of physical controls. So starting from left from the left and moving to the right, uh, you have a a mag switch, starter switch combo, master alternator switch, uh, some lighting switches, a pitot heat. Avionics master, trim wheel, throttle, if it's a TD2 mixture knob, pro, uh, excuse me, if it's TD2, a prop knob, and then a mixture knob. And then on the very far end, you have a flaps, and that one flaps handle. That's like a, uh, a 172 style flaps handle where it drops into specific positions. Um, we'll talk a little bit, and this applies actually to the alloy, um, the TH1 as well. Those are real veneer uh, controls from, from an actual airplane. And so they work like you would expect them, the, the mixture and the throttle. Uh, you can twist them in for fine tune adjustments. You can pull them out for larger adjustments. The throttle has a rotating throttle lock on it, um, just like you would have in a 172, 182, 206. Um, so I think that that, like hardware wise, that's the TD. We've got a, a couple of questions. So I'm gonna go through these real quick. Um, all right, how can I load my way, a waypoint on my TD2 G1000 using lat long coordinates? Uh, I don't know the specific, the answer to that offhand, Chuck, um, but it, again, e, info at redbirdflight.com is the, or support at redbirdflight.com, um, and, and I can look into that uh, after this webinar as well. Um, any plan, future plans for a G3? Um, G3X, I, I don't, I can't say that we've specifically said anything about that, but um, it, what we really want to do, I mean, it, so give you a little background. When we build these 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 panels, all of the software is an emulation. Garmin doesn't let us use their actual software, so we have to kind of build it from the ground up, and that's a very costly, time-consuming process. Um, and so we want to make sure when we build some an avionics kit that it's got a wide enough market to recoup the cost, honestly. I mean, that's really where it comes down to. So um, some, so something like the Michael's asking a question about um, an Aspen, that's way more likely than uh, the G3 right now, I think, based on our uh, understanding of the market. But I could be wrong. Um, so, you know, uh, that's kind of where it is. So to answer your question, Michael, if you buy one now and we uh, release an Aspen later, you should be able to update to that because that um, acrylic is on there with all the buttons and knobs is on there with four screw, four thumb screws in each one in each corner. You unscrew, you pull it off, you slip a new one on, it takes two minutes and you could have a new avionics set. So let's say you bought one now and a year from now we released an Aspen panel. Um, you would have, you could buy that Aspen panel and plug it in and it should work. Uh, at least that's the design. Um, 
okay, I've seen ads for boxes like a 750 uh, that ever be able to be added. So, okay, though I think what you're talking about is like the standalone hardware boxes that some of the other some other companies, sim companies make. Um, so on the J, you could add those right now, um, and they would work um, because we're just running the simulation engine. It can connect to whatever it wants. In the TD, that's a little bit trickier because we do a lot of um, we do a lot of configuration stuff internally to make it work with our our software and our services and to run in kind of a controlled environment. Um, it may or may not work, but even if it does work, it'll probably it would invalidate the um, FAA approval. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, Kurt is asking if you can buy the overlays for both the analog and G1000 and switching back and forth. Yes, you can. Um, you can. So in the base price, so let's talk about that. The TD base price is um, $8,000. The TD2 is $9,000. Um, that base price includes one or the other. So it includes the analog or the G1000. You can add the other for a, a, an add-on cost. We make a ton of options for the TD. Um, the hardware options, you can add two more monitors on the side, we call it Horizon. And if you're doing VFR maneuvers, that can be really advantageous. Um, the table that it's sitting on, we actually sell as well because the TD is a pretty heavy device and it kind of hangs under the table um, and most of the weight is on the front. So you'll notice that those legs stick out a little bit. That's It was specifically designed to um, be stable if you're cranking on the yoke. Um, and um, and so we and we sell the additional panel, um, and actually we sell a platform where that table sits on a, a custom-made platform with a with a chair that's out of our larger sims and includes the rudder pedals from our larger sims. Um, so depending on what you need, we can kind of scale it up and down. Uh, okay, so we got one more uh, question: What is the main outcome of using a TD? Is it just for fun? No. So the TD is is was so. The TD was designed to be used in a flight school. Honestly, when we we came up with the idea, it's a it, uh, 2000 and I don't know nine, 2010, something like that. Uh, we came up with the idea of the TD. It was we thought that flight schools would buy it, and um, sorry about that. Um, that flight schools would buy it, and that uh, consumers wouldn't. But um, Honestly, a lot of pilots, individual pilots have been buying it and using it for training. And the specific reason they use it for training is because of the change to FAR 6157C2. Um, what that, as of 2018, what uh, November 2018, I think, is that allows you to uh, log your six approaches in six months and a hold uh, at home on a TD2 without an instructor being present. So you can maintain your instrument currency requirements uh, on a TD2 or a TD without um, just you sitting in there. Um, so that's been a big um, a big driver of that. I would also say the TD is a, is a wonderful tool for this kind of proficiency training that I was talking about earlier, where we can build uh, a plan to work on these specific maneuvers the TD is going to provide a lot of value in that long term, um, and it will it'll probably save you some money. Um, it, it may be depending on how much you fly, it may be a two year, three year payback, but in those two or three years, it'll save you some money, and it will definitely make you a better pilot because you can. The TD has a full range of failures. Um, you can add the instructor station software, and you can have an instructor with you on the TD where they can change the weather, move you, change, put you in different positions, change, add failures, all kinds of stuff. It's got a full set of controls, just like our large sims that uh, do. So it's, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of training advantages to the TD. Um, so we've got a couple more. Um, okay, so Chuck's, Real quick, Chuck's asking about a TD flight uh, flight analysis option. So this is on the TDs, it's on the um, Js, it's and it's also on our big sims. Uh, we have a thing called the pilot key, which is if you go to account.redbirdflight.com, you can create an account and um, create a pilot key 
that you can stick into your computer. It downloads, it's a little USB, you stick a little USB thumb drive in your computer, downloads a file, and then you plug it into any Redbird SIM and you can connect, uh, you can type in a pin and now that flight is being recorded to your profile. So you fly that flight, you shoot some ILSs, you do whatever, uh, and it gets uploaded to the Redbird cloud. And then after the flight, you can go back, you can go to debrief.redbirdflight.com. You'll see it, you'll see a, um, a map overview, an altitude track. Um, you, if you have a Cloud Ahoy account, um, actually that's not true yet, wait for it. Uh, you should be able to send your flights into Cloud Ahoy sometime soon. Um, you can connect it to uh, four flights so that when you fly a flight in the sim, it shows up in your four flight logbook automatically and you can um, edit it and accept it. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, again, that's a, the function of our, our, our cloud program and the pilot key. Uh, all right, we're getting a bunch of questions. All right, so let's go through some more. And then I'm, I wanna talk about the real nav. Actually, let's talk about the real nav now. Robert's been waiting long enough. Okay, so um, like I said, the nav data that comes on the SIM is pretty old. If you're gonna use it for instrument approaches at all, I suggest a real nav data subscription. You can get them in quarterly. You can get them every quarter or you can get them every 28 days. Um, it's a third-party software. We don't make any money on it. Um, we can, we essentially resell it to you if you want, or you can go to um, the, if you just Google real nav, you'll find a, um, go to the website, buy a subscription. I think it's $500, um, don't quote me on that. But then uh, you get your subscription. There are some settings in um, in your simulator and a little tool that you have to download to, up, to um, update your nav data. And there are instructions on how to do that on our support website, support.redbirdflight.com. Um, and that once you get a real nav subscription, now you have access to WAS approaches, LPVs, LNAVs, um, and you have SIDs and STARS, and you have updated nav data. Uh, if you're having um, issues like a runway isn't aligned, or maybe a runway numbers have changed, or frequency has changed, that's something you can actually talk to us about, and we can um, fix that for you. Um, but if it's nav data and approaches availability in a, in the GPS, you got to go through real nav to do that. Um, okay, uh, one real quick point is if you're doing, if you're using a TD as a basic aviation um, training device, you need to include uh, our alloy RD1 rudder pedals, or if you get the platform that includes pedals as well. Um, it is not approved with any other rudder pedals, so get the alloy ones. Um, okay, so another box question. Can it be applied for personal use and then taken off for the six approaches that can be logged? Does that invalidate? Okay, so um, Michael's asking about the question with the, um, uh, the, the standalone Garmin G750 box. So um, let me, I have to be a little careful because I don't want to give you bad advice that um, is the FAA might disagree with. So I would say if you're, if you're never going to use it for a, um, uh, a main, for currency, for meeting illegal currency, um, go ahead. You could try to figure it out. I mean, we may... Officially, we're not going to support it. Um, I'm I'm not 100% sure it's going to work, um, but you know, in all honesty, we'd probably try to help you out. Um, but if your goal is to use it for currency at some point, um, yes, you could disconnect it, assuming there wasn't any software changes we had to make to make it, or you had to make to make it work. Um, then um, you should be fine. But again, when it comes to that kind of stuff, I have to be you have to be make a, a decision about how much liability you want to expose yourself to when it comes to the FAA, asking about these particular approaches when you bust something. Um, and I certainly, the conservative answer is do not mess with it if you want to use it for instrument currency. Um, okay, are there any facilities to randomize uh, weather or other factors? So we have um, timed failures at this point is built into the instructor station. So you can, uh, you or your instructor can say, I want this system to fail in one minute, five minutes, or sometime between, I think it's five and 15 minutes, and then it'll randomly fail in that window. But that's, um, that's all we, that's the only random, um, sort of semi-random 
thing we have right now. Um, okay, I can use GIFT in which devices? So you can use GIFT in the TD, uh, both private and instrument. You can use GIFT in the J velocity. Um, you may be able to use GIFT in the J. Depending on how old the J is, it may or may not run it really smoothly. Um, and um, if you really are intending to use GIFT a lot, I would recommend the J velocity or the TD. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the J and the J velocity, when they come standard, are uh, single screen devices. So for all the instrument, GIF missions totally works. And we're gonna talk about GIF for those that don't uh, know. Um, all the instrument missions will certainly work. Most of the private pilot missions will work, but things like um, ground reference maneuvers, turns around a point, that kind of stuff, um, may be pretty tough to do with a single screen. If you have the three screen uh, expansion for the TD, which is called Horizon, uh, you can probably do those ground reference maneuvers, but um, yeah, just keep in mind that you have a single screen. Okay, uh, Justin is asking, are there instrument scenarios to perform with the Redbird? I use the SIM, um, I do the IFR magazine uh, scenario. Is there a monthly or weekly scenario that Redbird puts together? No, but that's a very good question, Justin. That's all I'm gonna say about it right now. <laughs> um, uh, are there are these sims specific to certain types of aircraft? Because um, I'm interested in using it for experimental types. Okay, so the J and the J velocity are not specific. You can load anything you want on there. Um, and I should mention that we do sell a version of the J velocity that runs X-Plane. Um, and if you have a experimental airplane that you've built a air model for in X-Plane, you could run that on the J. Um, the TD is built around the the TD is basically a 172. The TD2 is somewhere it can be a 172 through essentially a souped up 182 or Bonanza even. Um, but that's kind of the, the range of that product. Now, certainly if you had um, the, uh, um, the home controls, the alloy controls, you could set that up for whatever you want. Um, okay. Uh, okay, uh, David, I think you're asking about third-party rudders for a TD, um, and it looks like you have one that's shipping next week. I will, hey, I'll follow up with the sales guys about that, David. Joey, Joey's on the call. She's managing the questions. Um, Joey, can you write down David's name, and we'll follow up to make sure we, he's going to be okay with the rudder pedals that he got. Um, Okay, we'll talk about the ATC add-on in a little bit, Chuck. Um, Leonard is asking, um, if you do not update the nav data often, does practicing approaches on the TD2 still count to currency? I assume so, yes. So the FAA does not care whether you are practicing um, your approaches with current nav data or 10-year-old nav data. Uh, in terms of what the FAA thinks is, an approach is an approach. So what you're practicing are approach procedures, not specific approach details. So the FAA has no concerns about updated nav data that uh, they've talked to us about. Um, and there's nothing in the regs that say it's got to have updated nav data. The truth is most pilots uh, really prefer updated nav data um, because it matches the approach plates and all that kind of stuff. So that's really what's driving that. Um, a thing that you could do is say, pay for one cycle of the real nav data, update everything to that cycle, and then save all the approach plates from that cycle, or save the approach plates of approaches that you're likely to fly from that cycle. So then you can go back and reference the approach plate as it existed when your when that uh, nav data was current. Um, so that was a good question, Leonard. Okay, um, does Red, Mark is asking, does Redbird use FSX? No, we don't. Um, we use Lockheed Martin prepared 3D, which is a derivative of FSX. Um, so the sort of the long story is Microsoft built FSX and then spun off a version called ESP, which added a bunch of developer tools and they made that a commercial version. They changed the end user's license so that companies like ours could use it as the core of their simulators. And they gave us a bunch of tools to interact with it. And then um, when Microsoft shut down FSX, they sold the, um, the, so the commercial right, like the selling it to consumer rights to one company, and then they sold the selling it to businesses and educational institutions to Lockheed. 
Baki took it and has been building on that base and actually done a ton of stuff to it um, to create the prepared product. Um, okay. And uh, Mark is asking with a Coronado 182, you can definitely add a Coronado 182 to the, to the J for sure. Um, uh, again, the TD is pretty much limited to what it's got. And um, Dan is asking about an older model, YK1, without a hat switch, can I upgrade? Uh, I think we, we do have, we've worked with some people on that. Um, so that would be re reach out to us at info at redbirdflight.com and we, we may have a path forward for that. Okay, so uh, appreciate everybody. All right, let's go on to um, kind of our the Redbird supporting tools and software. And I am gonna talk a little bit about some third party stuff as well. So we'll start, um, Redbird Corvus is a newer product for us. And it's, um, I think both Corvus and Cygnus are $500. And Corvus is software that runs on the simulation that connects the simulator to your four flight um, EFB uh, that's running. And it uses the same um, it, over Wi-Fi. And it uses the same protocol as uh, four flight uses with like Scout or any of the, um, the ADSB devices that can connect to four flight. Um, so what it, Corvus is actually giving you ADSB style data so in addition to like where you are on the map, so you can you know, see yourself on the approach, see yourself on the course, uh, which can be a really beneficial thing if you fly with four flight a lot to be sure you're using it while you're training on the sim. Um, it'll give you AHARS information so you can pull up the synthetic vision um, part of four flight as well. And on the roadmap is to be able to push weather in, uh, which I think will be a huge advantage. So you'd actually be able to read METARs and TAFs and that kind of stuff from four flight um, based on what's happening in the simulation. So Cygnus is like Corvus. Uh, it's just, it actually uh, uses a third, it uses a Bad Elf GPS um, transmitter to connect to the iPad via your iPad via Bluetooth. And you can use Cygnus with like Garmin Pilot or the Jepson products and four flight as well. It just provides position data. It doesn't provide any of the other ADSB stuff. So Corvus only works with ForeFlight because ForeFlight is really the only company that's implemented kind of a public -er, a, a, a public API to talk to to give us so that we can give them that kind of information. Corvus or with Cygnus, excuse me, we're actually um, talking to the iPad itself and telling the iPad, hey, I'm at this spot and I'm moving this fast. Um, and so it works with any app that uses location data. So um, and then Gift is. A, a slightly different product. So GIFT is, it stands for Guided Independent Flight Training. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we have two courses. We have a private pilot course and an instrument course. And uh, a lesson is, it's really designed to teach maneuvers and tasks, um, specifically for that, that level of certification. So in private pilot, we'll have steep turns, normal landings, and slow flight, that kind of thing. And it includes a video, a written description of what you're gonna do, and then an objectively coached and scored mission that runs on the simulator. So you'll start a flight, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll start a gift flight. There may be artifacts like little gates in the sky that you fly through. Um, and, um, and, you know, markers on the ground, whatever, it's mostly private pilot um, that will help guide you. And then there's coaching that runs. It'll say, adjust your power or you're too high or too low. And then at the end of it, it generates a score based on the ACS that says you performed this way. And if you're talking about objectively measuring your proficiency to, to your level of certification, GIFT is really the only thing that's out there right now. Um, so even if you are already a pilot or an instrument rated private pilot, GIFT could still be a really nice tool to use to measure yourself, to keep your skills sharp on those sort of core fundamental skills and to measure your, um, your proficiency at them over time. Uh, and again, when you complete a GIFT flight, all that data gets uploaded um, uh, all that data can be uploaded to our cloud and you can review it for later. Um, so if you go to gift.redbirdflight.com, there's a bunch more details about it. Okay, so some of the third-party add-ons, probably the most beneficial for a currently rated pilot is something called Pilot Edge, which is an air traffic controller service that you can connect to. It's a paid subscription. Again, it's a third-party thing. We have really nothing to deal with, to do with it. We are 
working with them to make the process of getting it set up much easier. And I would expect some news about that soon. But um, the you you'll be in your on your on your simulator flying around. I think mostly they're limited to the West Coast, but I know they want to expand it. Um, but you'll be let's say flying around in the LA basin, um, and you can request approach clearance. You'll get in route instructions. You'll request an IFR clearance, get in route instructions, departure instructions. They'll vector you for the approach. There'll be other traffic that maybe you have to deal with. Um, it's really good, and you're talking to another a real person who has controller training. I think most of them are actually controllers. Um, it can be a really beneficial tool for um, if you're not particularly comfortable on the radio or you really want to work on uh, how to fly in the system, especially a busy system like the LA Basin. And that's, I think, why they chose that, that region to focus on. Um, so Pilot Edge is a, is a great service for that. Um, another one that you can fly on, especially if it's uh, you want to be a little more casual about it, I would say, would be VATSIM, which is a much wider, wide, wide use, and I think it may be free, service where they have um, similar controllers that, that give you instructions. But the thing about VATSIM is that it's just people. It's not, uh, there's, they, I think they have a training program, but it's not like as rigorous uh, as the Pilot Edge. And I think Pilot Edge really does employ actual air traffic controllers. So there may be some uh, inconsistencies about how a VATSIM controller would control you versus how an actual ATC controller would. So if you're, um, you know, a, an instrument rated pilot, especially um, working on that kind of training, I think Pilot Edge is a great tool. Um, okay, so Henry is asking um, support for the Avidine panel mount navigators. Um, again, that's really depending on on demand. Um, Henry, we can if you send an email to info at redbirdflight.com, um, we can kind of look through what. I don't know offhand of a specific project that's working on that, but um, we can kind of look through it and, and go through some, and let you know what, yes or no. Um, okay, so that's our product line. Um, hopefully that covered a lot of stuff that you guys actually cared about, but um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, how to use the simulator. Now this slide comes directly from um, my lesson on how to, um, be a better instructor in one of our larger sims. So a lot of it, so this is really tailored for instructors, but it totally applies to you if you're using a simulator by yourself. And honestly, it applies whether you're using a real a Redbird sim or you know Microsoft Flight sim on a home sim on a PC with a joystick. Um, it's still this this matters. Um, having a goal for every session, I think, is super critical. When you get in and you start goofing off, it becomes a toy very very quickly. And if you, um, as soon as your mind starts thinking that the simulator is a toy, it really reduces the training value that you're gonna see from it. Um, so having a goal and sticking to it, trying to accomplish it, and that circles back to when we made our plan and we said, we're gonna have a goal for everything we do um, in using real world or realistic weather. So one of my huge pet peeves about our products uh, is, our default flights, when you start a flight uh, normally, if you don't change anything, it defaults to unlimited visibility, clear skies, um, no clouds, calm wind, 29.92 on the altimeter, uh, which doesn't happen in real life, right? We don't see that. Um, so even if you're just flying, uh, you wanna practice VFR maneuvers in your sim, um, I would still set visibility at 30 miles and put so a scattered cloud layer at 7,000 feet, whatever the case may be, um, just to have it feel more real, realistic in there. Um, and then if you're creating an IFR situation, this is when I talk about real world weather. What I mean is if there are, if you're a pilot, uh, you probably check the weather every morning, uh, at least I do. And if there are interesting weather days, I will frequently, um, especially when I was instructing full time, take screen captures of that briefing. So go on for flight, get a briefing for a flight, screen capture everything they get you and save it um, so that you can fly in that weather situation at a later date and see a briefing for what that weather would look like. Um, and say, and, and David asked the obvious question, does, this, does the sim have the option to pull in real world, real world weather into the sim. Um, 
no, but it's it's a thing on our list to make happen. Um, okay, so uh, using headsets and ATC services. So I think um, this is most, mostly for the big sims, but um, I think it still applies. This is, again, just about creating a realistic situation. So when you put on a headset, you are flying. That's the only time you wear a David Clark is when you're in the cockpit, right? And so it can really make it, um, it can really sell it to your mind a little bit better that this is a, a flying activity and this is not a video game and we're going to take this serious. And then again, if you're using ATC services, I think uh, that's a big advantage. And what I mean, what I mean by that is, is primarily Pilot Edge. Um, and the, um, uh, on the, so using the aviation headset, one of the things that uh, I think it's important to use an aviation headset and not a USB computer headset. And we do make a little box that is, well, you plug the USB cable into it and then you can plug two, you can, um, um, you can plug an aviation headset into it and it'll work. And I think that's a great tool. It's called Headset Connect. I think it's $99. Um, and then instead of using a game headset or something like that, again, you're using the, your Bose or your David Clark and it feels way more real. Um, and the next two, keeping failures and limiting failures, keeping them realistic. This is uh, especially true for instructors because when an instructor gets in the sim, a lot of times they try to replicate airline style training where it's just awful, right? Like the weather's terrible and you lose the alternator and then you lose the attitude indicator. And then if you, and then you lose the number one radio and if you make it down, they fail the brakes and you crash anyways. So like that, that may, that works for airline training for professional pilots in a crew environment. Um, but for us, for general aviation pilots, we want to actually train for the things that we might see. So, you know, maybe fail the alternator, but make sure you have an option to get out. So don't just make it terrible where you crash and die every time you get in the sim. Um, and again, this is mostly for instructors, but if you're, if you're building out a plan, of, I'm going to do these, this sim session, that sim session, accomplish these things. Try not to make it so that every time you get in the sim, you have a failure, or every time you get in the sim, you have some major weather event. Um, it, those are important training and learning situations, but they're not the only training and learning situations. And by limit, limiting, limiting them, you actually make them more impactful when they do happen. Um, and then never create inescapable situations. That's really mostly for the instructors, but don't do it to yourself. Um, and knowing when to pause. So this is a real, real interesting thing. All of our sim, the J's, the TD's, all the way up to the big sims, all have a pause button. It's the most important button in the simulator. Um, but knowing when to use it is key. So what I tell instructors is uh, you can tell when a student is behind the airplane, but trying to keep up or when the student is behind the airplane and falling further behind it. You pause when they're falling further behind, you let them let the scenario run when they're keeping, when they're trying to keep up. Because when they're trying to keep up, that is an important, important skill. Because obviously you don't have that pause button in the airplane. And when you get in that situation, it's useful to have experience um, being behind and trying to get caught back up. That's a really important skill. Uh, and you can, it's a, sim is a great place to learn it. So don't pause, don't, don't pull that learning away from yourself or from a student, let them run through it and let yourself run through it. But if it's being totally over, if you're being totally overwhelmed and no new learning is going to happen, that's when you pause and you kind of take a break and say, okay, what's happening? Um, can I reset this? Okay, so I'm gonna go through a couple of questions. Um, all right, Trevor uh, is asking about Parrot. So Parrot was a product that we used to sell that did ATC stuff. Um, honestly, no, we're probably not going to have a new version of Parrot. Um, the truth is Parrot, when it was originally designed, was honestly, the voice recognition technology was a little behind the times. Uh, it wasn't up to snuff. And um, it may be now, but honestly, we don't know that there's a, um, it may not be, the development may not be worth it. It's a very difficult technology to, to get right based on all the other variables. What Parrot did was um, it was just a computer program that run that would give you instructions like takeoff clearances and, and instrument clearances and that kind of stuff. And it was up to, the idea was up to and including a full flight. It's just too many variables to really do uh, well. And so, at least with a computer right now. Um, 
since the TD series is really designed for flight schools and loggable simulation, why use a realistic split elevator switch and include aviation audio plugins? Um, split elevator switches. Um, okay, so I think this is a question about why, like, what's the, what are some of the product design choices around the TD? Um, and the truth is, the product design choices are to meet the market, basically, to meet the requirements to be a certified device and to meet the market. Um, if there's anything, you know, if there are things that you think the TD should have, uh, I really do appreciate your your question, honestly. If there are things that you think the TD should have and is a, a, not a good feature, let us know about it. I mean, we want to make a product that is most the most valuable for the price um, and we still make money on. Um, so, you know, please, you know, if there are uh, things you think the TD should do, let us know about it. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're going to do it necessarily. We have to make a decision concerning our business, but um, we do appreciate the feedback. So thank you, Kurt. Um, can the SIM do icing? Yes, it definitely can do icing. Um, it's in the instructor station. It's also, if, if you have the instructor station add-on for the TD, you can do it there. You can also use the keyboard on the J or the TD to go into the weather menu inside of prepared um, by hitting the Alt A key, I think. And then you can tab over to the different menus. Um, and you can pull down weather and you can add icing in the menu. Um, if you have the instructor station, it's just a one-click button, super easy to do as well. Okay, so that's how or what what the the tips to use it effectively. So what can you expect? Um, you're talking procedural training. You're talking uh, it's it's like the best kind of chair flying you can do. Obviously, um, you can work through checklists, procedures, emergencies. You can go into your um, one of the biggest things I think is flying to new places, especially places you're going to go. This the, the database, um, the the terrain database is pretty accurate um, to the world. So if there's a lake, um, there's oh, if there's a lake in the real world, the lake exists in the sim. So you can look at a VFR chart and navigate by uh, reference point. You can also um, if you're shooting approach, if you're going into an airport, a new airport that happens to be next to a highway, I have a, if you ever find me, to, I have a great story about shooting uh, an instrument approach into um, Meacham Field in Fort Worth when it was icing at night uh, and almost landing on a, a um, highway because the highway runs right next to the runway. So that's the kind of thing that if you have a sim, you can go do that flight before you actually take it, pop out of the clouds and go, oh, hey, there's a, there's a highway right there. That, I should remember that when I do this in real life. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, we got one question from Trevor. More choices for GIFT um, or other add-ons like multi-engine? Yeah, um, I do think there will be more choices, uh, more, more varieties of GIFT that'll be coming out in the future. And can extra monitors be added to the J? So the J specifically does not have a video card that can support extra monitors. The J velocity, I think that's true. You, you may need to double check because we change the build configurations pretty frequently, like the hardware build. Um, the J velocity does have a video card that can support extra monitors. So you should be able to plug them in. There may be some configuration setups. And when you do when you do things like that, the tr I mean, our official policy is it's not supported. So you may have to go in there and muck with getting the cameras to look right. In all honesty, we'd probably help you out, but um, Officially, it's not wouldn't be a supported up, um, modification, but the velocity should have the hardware to do it. Um, okay, so we're running a little bit long, so I'm going to wrap us up here quickly. So um, basically, we've covered all of this stuff, right? Uh, using VATSIM Pilot Edge, flying that route. Um, beforehand, emergency procedures, that kind of stuff, and avionics familiarization. Okay, uh, Bill asks, can you use GIFs on a home PC? No, you cannot. It only runs on a Redbird um, device right now. There's a bunch of stuff, bunch of software that's going on in there to make it generate that score and to provide all the coaching. So that's um, really the end of the presentation. I'm gonna keep this slide up if there's any questions, because I think it's really key to effectively using a Redbird. Um, but if there's no more questions, I'll give it a couple, a minute or two, and then we'll go ahead and end. So thank you everybody for your time. I appreciate all the questions. Hopefully I provided something useful and it wasn't a bunch of 
me just preaching about proficiency. Um, so thanks everybody.